So obviously we're a little pared down today, but we still get to be together and worship God. That's right. And you even got an extra half hour of sleep or free time or whatever you did with your time. So I hope you enjoyed that. I went for a walk in the snow early this morning. It was uh, pretty nice. You may have seen those pictures on Facebook if you were online early. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. Uh, it's great to be here. Most of the students are traveling. Uh, many of the families actually are traveling. Happy Thanksgiving week. It's the beginning of a holiday week for a bunch of people. So I hope you're in the mood for uh, Thanksgiving because that's what we're going to be talking about today in a sense. Uh, while we get started, uh, Henry, could I ask you to say a prayer for us? Absolutely. We just all hands with the person next to us. And uh, let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, first of all, thank you for every woman and man in this circle. Thank you for how dear they are to you, how much you cherish each and every one of them. Even if it's sometimes we don't appreciate your incredible devotion to us. Father, thank you that today we get to come and express a modicum of gratitude for how much you've done for us and who you are. And Father, as we worship today, I pray that out of our hearts during this period of special focus on Thanksgiving, that we remember every kindness, every blessing, every comfort, all that you've done to get our attention so that we can have a hope and a future that's worth having. Bless this worship. We're grateful for it. We love you more than life itself. So Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Henry. Uh, actually, turn your Bibles. We're going to end up over Luke 6, but I'd like to start in Romans chapter 11, if you would. Okay. Uh, so the title of our sermon today, we're going to uh, do the sermon first, and then we're going to do communion or the Lord's Supper later. Uh, Stacy and Alex are going to lead our thoughts in uh, communion in just a few minutes. And I'm not going to go long, because I don't have a lot to say, but I think what I do have to say is probably pretty important. Because um, I don't want to waste your time, nor mine. <laughs> Romans chapter 11. Um, and we're going to start reading in verse 33. If you, if you look at the title of that section, it's called doxology. And doxology is just kind of a fancy word for like a formula for praising God. Uh, it's a word that probably we don't use a whole lot um, in our modern language, you know. And, and in particular, our church, we tend to not be a very like traditional church or rooted in like traditions um, that, that go back for very long. I mean, we, we have our own traditions, I would probably say. But the doxology and, and, and saying sort of formulaic prayers and praise is not one of our faith traditions per se in our church. That doesn't mean it's wrong. And, and actually, I think it could be very helpful because otherwise we might be left trying to praise God uh, and, and not really knowing what to say. You know, like, God, I praise you for who you are, God. God, you were just like uh, good to the last drop, God. It's just, uh, you, you know, God, you can have it your way, God. And mm -mm -mm, I'm loving it, God. It's my pleasure, God, to, to pray to you. You know what I mean? Like, we might just be making some stuff up. Uh, we got Chick-fil-A, we got Burger King, we got, what, Folgers Coffee in there. Sometimes it's okay to have a formula for praise, especially if you just find yourself not really knowing what to say. Uh, and actually, that's a biblical tradition. So let's look at uh, Paul's doxology here in the book of Romans. He says this in verse 33 of chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. 
scholars believe that this was a prayer of praise that was very common in the first century church. And uh, so there's nothing wrong with traditions and with uh, doxologies and even formulaic prayers at times, as long as it's not only a formula, not just a formula, but it's something that helps our heart to sing to God or helps our minds to bend towards gratitude yeah. for God and all that God has done. Uh, at the end of my little sermon here, we're going to sing a doxology that's become a tradition for the, the, the Kramer and, and Malcolm family. And we're going to do it on Thanksgiving Day as we get together. And we'll, we'll go over that. I'll teach it to you uh, in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to remind you of why we choose as Christians to be thankful. Uh, you know, this week, a lot of people are going to be focusing on gratitude, and rightly so, whether they're, they're religious or not. And, and I think that's only a good thing. It can only help for people to focus on gratitude, whether you believe in God or not. Uh, and there's, there's scientific research that backs this up. As you bend your mind towards being grateful, it changes the way that you think and experience your life. And the more you can choose to be grateful, the more joy you're going to find. And by the way, the more things you're going to find to be grateful for. So whether you believe in God or not, it's just a good idea to be grateful. However, we believe in God. And so it's exponentially better for us, who not only can choose to be grateful for our current circumstances, but we get to choose to be grateful for all that God has done in the past, everything that God is doing right now, and, and this is the thing that's unique to believing in God and Christianity, all of the promises of God that are coming in the future. Not only for our lives and sort of, you know, situational things and relationships, but also the ultimate hope of salvation and of Jesus' return. That's a way of saying that when God chooses and when the time is right, he's going to set all things right. And we get to choose to be grateful for that. Uh, another way to say that would be simply grace. The idea of God's grace. All of the things that he's done in the past. All the things that he's given us right now, currently, and all of the graces that we're going to receive, the benefaction, the favor that we're going to receive from God in the future, and ultimately, the hope of salvation one day. Uh, it's not only one day, though. We get to live as citizens of the kingdom right now, if we choose. Uh, the idea of grace is something that we've been studying uh, for two and a half months now. Simple grace. And if you recall, grace was not uh, originally a religious term until Paul made it that. Originally, the term grace or charis, uh, it's, it's spelled C-H-A-R-I-S. And so in English, it looks like charis. In Greek, you would say something more like charis. Uh, that term meant a relationship between a benefactor, someone of means, and someone who did not have means. So the benefactor would reach down, show favor, give some blessing or benefaction to someone in need. And that relationship was not only one way, it was reciprocal. So the person receiving the benefit would also show grace and gratitude by reciprocating, whether it's giving a gift to the giver or simply proclaiming how incredible the gift was to everyone else. And uh, there, was a, there was a saying even uh, in this time in, in the Greek Empire and the Roman Empire in the Middle East that even if I cannot repay, I'll proclaim for the rest of my life that I'm un able to repay this gift. That's a quote from Seneca. Uh, and so grace does not just mean some ambiguous benefit from God. But actually, it's, it's more like the doxology. It's more like the song that we're going to sing here in a minute, that every good thing that we have is from God. Everything. Whether we acknowledge it or not. Now let's, let's look at this scripture in Luke chapter 6. And I'm going to start reading here in verse 35. This is a section where Jesus is uh, preaching and teaching about how to think as a citizen of the kingdom. How to treat people as a citizen of the kingdom. Luke chapter 6, starting at verse 35. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. 
and you'll be sons and daughters of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. So as the world, or, or anyway in our country, as the U.S., uh, focuses on gratitude this week, uh, it tends to be kind of a one-off thing and doesn't even last for the full day. Because then comes Black Friday, right? We move from being grateful for what we have to thinking about all of the things that we need. Need in quotes. And we all have TVs, but man, there's a great deal. And it's almost like you're saving money if you get up at 4 a.m. and stand in line and buy that TV. That's not saving money, by the way. That's free financial advice. You're not saving any money. You're spending money. Let's throw that out there. But we are, uh, we're just inundated with blind consumerism. And I think it affects us more than we understand. It's surrounding us, and it's in every advertisement. We're told that we are the sum of the possessions that we have. And so if you want to feel good about yourself, if you want your life to be good, you need this next thing, this next trinket. And then six months later, or not even that, if you live in a house with kids as we do, you look at it and it's old and rusted or somebody is colored all over it and doesn't even work like it's supposed to anymore and you need another new trinket. And if you only get that one, your life will simply be complete. And it's such a lie. It is. <laughs> and yet, don't you find yourself wanting stuff? Yeah. It's, it's in there for all of us. We all struggle with some form of greed. And corporate America and capitalism wants to feed on that and get us to spend our money thinking that that's where we find meaning in life. I want to challenge us not only to be grateful for the hour that we sit down and maybe even talk about gratitude and things that we're thankful for on Thursday. Hopefully you're going to have a meal with friends or family and you're going to talk about things you're grateful for. But I want to challenge what it means even to be grateful. Uh, because we think of, of gratitude as a sentiment, as a feeling. And I don't think that's a complete understanding or definition. In the same way that grace is not a sentiment or a feeling, and faith is not a sentiment or a feeling. None of those things uh, are encapsulated just as a feeling. But instead, gratitude should be in our actions and the way that we live our lives. And if you go back to that Luke chapter 6 and verse 35 scripture, Jesus is teaching us how to think and therefore how to act. And he says, love your enemies. And that's radical. That's something that we've been hearing for a long time if you've been going to church. But it is a radical idea to love your enemies. It even goes above and beyond what the Greeks in the first century would have thought of as grace. That's outside of just benefaction and favor. Because oftentimes uh, the benefactor would give a gift and, and really sort of expect that there would be some reciprocity, even if it's only gratitude. But Jesus is saying, actually, no, you should love your enemies. Pray for those people and see if you can even do good to those people. Because, by the way, that's how God treats us. Jesus says that in the next sentence. He says, God loves the wicked and the ungrateful. Now, that word ungrateful, it sounds a lot like karis. It's akaris or without grace. Ungrateful in Greek just means without grace, without the reciprocity that comes from receiving a benefit from God. And uh, I, I want to challenge us this week not to be found with a karis, with no grace, with no gratitude. Not only for what you currently have, but also for what comes. And in this context, in grace context of the New Testament, faith is not a feeling, it's not only a belief. But grace, more than that, means dependability. Uh, if you receive a benefit, in this grace relationship, uh, you then accept joyfully the obligation to reciprocate that grace with gratitude. And so again, I want to challenge us this week not only to have a sentiment of gratitude, but to be faithful with that, to prove faithful, not to break the faith and just go on our days as if God hasn't given us every good thing, but instead choose to bend our minds towards all of the things that God has given us and all of the things that God has promised to give us 
and think about how God feels about us and then treat other people in that same way. That's one of the many ways that we can prove faithful this week. And I know, um, you know, a lot of families get together on Thanksgiving and sometimes it's really great and sometimes it's really stressful. If you're being honest, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and sometimes with our families, it can be uh, harder even to be loving to our families than it is to some random person. But it shouldn't be that way. Let's show grace with our families. And as we're inundated with advertisements for all of the stuff that we need, let's choose not to be blind consumers, but instead to be grateful for what God has given us and to learn contentment in whatever situation we are and uh, to live lives of, of gratitude. Now, I want to teach you guys a song that uh, our family, the Malcolm family, has learned through the Kramer family. And the Kramer, immediate, the Henry Kramer family learned it from the Edward Tyler Kramer family. And it's a generational tradition now to sing the doxology. Uh, and it's a really, it's a cool song. And what, what we usually do is uh, we sit down at the table, we hold hands, we take a few minutes, or not even a few minutes, a few seconds to think about God and all the things God has given us. And then we sing the words to the doxology, which is praise God through whom all blessings flow. Make a mental note, because we're going to sing this in a second. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Wait, I skipped the line, I think, right? From whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Okay, you got it? Even if you don't have it, just listen and kind of mind the words, okay? Is it in the book? Oh, what number in the book? Oh, there you go. 105 in your songbooks. Yeah, there we go. All right. 105. Thanks, Lana. So, why don't we uh, take five seconds to think about what we're grateful for, all the things that God has done in our lives. I'll give you a note and then we'll sing. is all about, right? So grace, the word grace is kadis. Without grace, without gratitude is a kadis. But the reciprocal aspect of grace is called eukadis. And that has become what we call the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. And so it's not just a time for us to pass the trays and eat some bread and drink some juice, but, but actually us taking the Lord's Supper on a weekly basis is one of the many opportunities for us to proclaim the goodness of God that we see primarily through Jesus, Jesus' sacrifice and rebirth. So as we take the Eucharist meal together, let's, let's remember all that Jesus has done for us. And uh, Alex and Stacey are going to lead our thoughts for that. Hey, my God, good morning. Uh, if you guys could turn your Bibles over to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And uh, we're going to be talking about who God chose and how we are chosen uh, as his people. And, and it, to really take the focus off of us and really put the focus on God and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 6, but I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter this week and really think about what God's done and who he is and not who you are. Um, I'm going to start in verse 6. It says, For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. All of the people on earth, out of all of the people on earth, the Lord your God 
has chosen you to be his own special treasure. The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you are more numerous than the other nations, for you are the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply because the Lord loves you, and he was keeping the oath he had sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a stronghold from slavery and from the oppressive hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. And I was thinking about this, we were talking yesterday, and it's easy for me uh, to want to measure up. And I want to say, well, this is why God has me here. This is why God has given me this opportunity. Um, and I'm like, well, no, that's not the reason at all. God shows me because he knows how messed up I am. He knows how messed up we all are without the sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross. And it's easy to just, well, I amount to this and I'm worthy of the sacrifice. But it's, it's the exact opposite. We're amounting to nothing without Christ. But because of the opportunity, because of the chance that we get to have to live with God and Jesus seeing us fit as a sacrifice, that's why we're here. We're not, it's not because of anything special that we've done or the things that we're good at. And those are the easy things to share. It's not easy to share what we're bad at and where we fall short, but that's where God is calling us to. He wants us to express, well, he wants us to know how this is the opportunity to really understand the sacrifice where we see we're not anything without God. We're not able to be anything good without God. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, we get to approach God with a confidence because he knows that he loves us. He chose us because he loves us. And he wants us to be with him. And when we think about the cross, that's what's been on my mind. Because all the time I feel, oh, I, I, hate, I hate when I'm taking communion and I start thinking about myself. Because it's not about me. It's about the sacrifice that Jesus has died for. And I don't need to be reminded of where I fall short. I get to reminded of the life I get to live now because of Christ. And um, when we, I just want us to move forward and think about where it's not about us. If we can move forward and think about what Christ has done to give us this life and the life that we get to live, that'll change our perspective on, on, the, on the cross. And as we take communion together, let's see. Yeah, so I think um, what I like to focus on on, on this passage um, was verse 9. It says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. And so I really liked um, this part because um, it, it just shows um, who God is and how he is God and he is faithful and he chose to keep a covenant of love and that even goes back to Exodus 6, 6, and it says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out, of, out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you from an outstretched arm with mighty acts of judgment. And I think it's crazy um, that he kept this covenant to the Israelites, knowing that they would lack faith and that they would lack trust in him through their journey to the promised land. And I think even applying it to today, how God keeps a covenant of love to us is when he did send Jesus to die on the cross for us because I think even thinking through that um, I think him dying for our sins um, knowing that some people knowing the sins that we are going to participate in and knowing that some people wouldn't even want a relationship with him I think it's crazy that he would continue to to keep that promise to us and um, I don't know I just think that it, it reminds me of how um, how God is not um, he doesn't give us conditional love but it is um, unconditional and that he is faithful and, and pure and he gives us a promised love and I think I just wanted to reflect on that today as we um, took communion uh, just to rem remember the covenant um, that he promised us. Amen. Let's pray. 
God, thank you so much just for the life that you've given us and for the sacrifice of your son that we get to be here together, uh, that we get to move forward and think about the life we live and we're be, we'll be able to live instead of always reflecting on the past. God, you've taken that away. You've given us new life. And it's because of your sacrifice that we're here. Uh, I pray that we are during this week, during this week of Thanksgiving, that that's what we can be thinking about, the life that you've given us. Uh, it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
uh, family time and friend time and help us, God, to bend our minds towards all that you're doing in our lives and all that you've done in our lives and all of the hope of uh, you coming through with your promises in the future in our lives. And I pray that we can respond to you with grace and gratitude and that we can treat other people, even the folks who don't love us and may even consider us enemies, with love and grace and gratitude. Help us um, to live these lives of, of gratitude, namely this week. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're dismissed.